just for a quick second, I just turn your eyes upon Jesus, live full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely deep in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Live full in his wonder. The things of this world will grow strangely deep in the light of his glory and grace. Just one more time. Won't you turn your eyes upon Jesus? Live full in his wonder. The things of the world will grow strangely deep in the light of his glory and grace. O oh God of heaven, the fear of you is a gift that you give to the ones that you desire to make wise. Your word says that the fear of you is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, would you do a kind work in this place this morning of baptizing us with the fear of you? Would you do a kind work in this house this morning of baptizing every soul present and even those who are listening online from different parts of the world give us the gift of the fear of you in Jesus name blessed be the name of the Lord good morning everyone I want to thank um, pastor David pastor Sarah for the opportunity to share God's word. I also want to thank all the pastorate <laughs> that have received me so warmly and so kindly. They've been so hospitable to me. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone as well. God is kind. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah 6. Before Isaiah, could we read um, Genesis 28? I'll be reading with the NASB. Genesis 28. I'm going to be reading from verse 11. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place and, placed, and put it under his head, and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood over it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. There is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Can we now go to Isaiah 6? 
from verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the, the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, finally, can we read um, Revelations chapter um, 1? Revelation 1, verse 17. From verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. If you're going to be taking notes, you can title this The Terror of the Living God. The Terror of the Living God. It is not coincidental that whenever the manifest, tangible presence of God appeared, it seemed to leave awestruck, often trembling men in its wake. Whenever the Shekinah of God, whenever his tangible presence came, it seemed to leave trembling men in its wake. There seems to be something about God that reminds you of everything that you are not. His holiness reminds you that you are not holy. His glory reminds you that you are not glorious. His beauty instructs you about how much you fall short in your understanding of what beauty is. This is a beautiful altar. There are beautiful people sat in this room. You would look at a painting and say, this is beautiful. You would declare it beautiful because as much as, as far as you know, it looks, it appeals to you aesthetically. But when the beauty of God appears, sorry, let me rephrase that. When the one who is beauty appears, it will confound you because you will realize that you really don't know what beauty is. You don't, how do you judge what is beautiful? How does a fallen, broken man <laughs> appraise what is beautiful or what is glorious? His wisdom confounds you. You realize how lacking you are, how much you don't know. His power reminds you that you have none of your own. And when this happens, when men collide with the living God. I mean when they truly meet the living God and erupt into worship as all mortals tend to do when they collide with the divine. It is not a worship that is unaccompanied by terror, by a sense of terror. My eyes have seen the God of heaven. My eyes have seen the living God. So when you worship, it's not casual. When you worship, you tremble. Because you are even asking yourself, how, how, am I, how am I in the presence of this right now? Everything about him reminds you of everything that you are not. So that when you worship in truth, it is not a worship that is unaccompanied by terror. And the terror that I speak of is not a terror that, that, that God will smite you, but that he can smite you if he chose to do so. And who would question him? Who would ask him? He would be just in his judgment. 
he would be fair in whatever it is, it is he's chosen to do. It is a terror that makes it impossible for your worship to be mixed with hypocrisy. And when, I'm, when I speak of worship, when I'm talking about worship, please hold your mind back from immediately th assuming that I'm talking about singing. That's only a small fraction of what I'm talking about. It's not the totality of it. The whole man worships or none of him worships. The whole man worships or none of him worships. If your mouth is proclaiming adoration and your heart despises the precept of God, that's not worship, that's a show. Who are you doing that for? And no, it will not matter that you cried or that you fell on the floor, that you fell on the ground. You know what I think? I think that we've, we've there's such a thing as emotionalism and I think that sometimes we confuse that with the move of the Spirit. Don't get me wrong, the Holy Spirit can move you in an emotional way. But just as the Bible says in, in, in John uh, 15 or 16, that when the Spirit comes, He will testify of Jesus. So if it was the Holy Spirit that moved you, what will happen if you fall or you cry or whatever other physical manifestation um, you will display? Will be that there will be a measure of the Christ formed in you. You are not going to fall and go back to gossiping and backbiting. So when I speak of worship, I'm not, I'm not talking about an, an emotional paroxysm. No, that's not what I mean. I'm not talking about an emotional outburst. If you fall and you cry and you lift up holy hands and you do all the things and you go back to living as you were with no fear of God and no thought that God can smite that's not worship. You are putting up a show. And God sees you. God sees you. The whole man worships. Or none of him worships. Romans 12 says to offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. That means all of your faculties. That means all of your members. That means your mouth is not saying this and then your heart is saying that. Or your, or your heart is, your mouth is saying one thing and your, your hands are doing something else. Your legs are going somewhere that, the God, that God does not approve of. The whole man worships or none of him worships. And this worship is not one that is unaccompanied by terror. Thankfully for the believer, it is not a, a terror that makes us hide from God. It is a terror that makes us fall at his feet. And we declare, oh my Lord, you are God and I am not. Oh God of heaven, you are God. And I am not. This is worship that is done in truth. It is not unaccompanied by terror. It is not without a sense of terror. It compels the whole man. Deuteronomy 6 says you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart. With all of your might. With all of your soul. With all your strength. The health of a man's soul can be safely deduced from the quality of godly terror, from the quality of holy fear that characterizes his life. Meetings like this are wonderful because they edify us and they remind us of things like this. But do not for a moment think that because you did all of this or that you can do all of this and that any of this means anything if it does not 
if he does not furnish your heart with godly fear. There's such a scarcity of the commodity of the fear of God in our time. Don't think for a second that any of this will mean anything if he does not furnish godly fear in you. You don't live trembling at the God of heaven. The fact that he even made the first move to reach you. I hope you know that you love him because he loved you first. So you can draw near because he drew near first. Do you come to church and you lift up holy hands and you go back home to hit your wife? Do you come and engage in long prayer hours in church and you go back home to dishonor and disrespect your husband? Your act of piety don't mean anything if you go back to carelessly see what the children that God has handed to you. It will shock you the number of children that entered into pornography because they found it on their parents' phones. Am I lying? It will shock you the number of children, the number of young adults, even old men now, and women, grown men and women, that are wrestling with various addictions because their parents opened the door. Do we come to church and lift holy hands and then we go back to making unjust gains? Do you know that there's, there's such a thing as making unjust gain? There's such a thing as ungodly profit. It's 200 naira, but you sell it for 2,000 naira just because you can. It happened last year or two years ago when there was a scarcity of cash. And we had to buy things. You were, we were buying money. I think we were buying 15,000 naira for 20,000 naira. Someone saw a gap, capitalizing on the suffering of people. And we will come to church and lift holy hands and do thanksgiving. Apostles in the marketplace, is this what God sent you to do? Capitalizing on the sufferings of people for the sake of profit. And you say, God, God did what? You come to church and lift up holy hands and then you go back to your bickering and your grumbling and your ill will and your gossiping and your backbiting. Your heart that is full of hatred and malice towards your brother and sister. Who do you think God is? Who do you think God is? And we, we think that God approves of our sins because we seem to to continue in these things and we pray and get results and you think oh it's not a big deal we think God is God is clapping for us and he's, he's encouraging us to go on it's not that big a deal let me tell you something if you are willingly living in sin and you seem to be getting answers to your prayers when you pray. Be afraid. You should be afraid. You think God approves. <laughs> but what is happening is that while his hand of grace is still extended to you and the ark is still open for you, your cup of recompense is getting full. And one day you will get what is due you. You will get it. Because God is holy. And he will not pamper sin. He will not entertain it. So if you are willingly living in sin and everything seems to be going right for you, be afraid. Be afraid. Because you will get what is coming if you do not repent. What does Hebrews 10 say? That if we willingly continue to live in sin, after coming into the knowledge of the truth, there's no sacrifice left. There's nothing, there's no sacrifice left to be offered for our sin. There's only judgment that awaits those who are adversaries of God. God says that if you continue to live in sin, even when you know the truth, you are his enemy. 
He does not change his mind because you came and raised up your hands and you sang, I, I love, I love you. Oh, see how I love you, Jesus. You know, we found a way to, we found a way to, how do I put this? We sort of found a way to make ourselves believe that the, 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 th the wrong things we do don't matter that much. We found a way to make ourselves believe that we just have to know the right spiritual principles to apply when there are things we need to obtain from God without necessarily living a life of consecration. So if you want a car, yeah, there's a, there are principles you can apply to faith for a car. If you want a house or something, there are spiritual principles you can apply. And there are Christians who live lives based on spiritual principles without the fear of God. What will you say when you stand before him? What will you say when you stand before the one in whose presence mountains skip like rams and hills like lambs? The Bible says that the sea saw him and fled. What will you say? How will you answer when you knew the truth? How will you answer to him? How will you answer? If man sets his sword against you, you can run to God and hide. God can fight for you. If the sword of God's wrath is on you, where will you run? Who will protect you? Who will fight for you? Who will be a go-between? What will you say when the terror of God visits you? When will you say when his wrath comes upon you? How will you answer for yourself when you knew to do better? Behold the love of God that extends a scarlet cord for you to hold on to. But the window of grace will not be eternally open. And the fact that you come to church and you speak Christianese is not what makes you a follower of God. It's not what makes you a disciple. If you continue living in sin, Scripture calls you God's enemy. You are his adversary. You know what he will do to his enemies. But behold the love of God that speaks this in your hearing so that if today you hear, you will not harden your heart. So that if there be secret sins, so that if there be any double-mindedness, any double living found in you, in your homes, you can hold on to that scarlet cord of grace and mercy. And you can cry out to God for help who will never turn a repentant heart away. The terror of God is to be feared. And if you make yourself eligible for that terror, God will be justified in whatever he chooses to do. God will be justified in whatever he chooses to do. He will be kind. He will be merciful. No sinner will be able to say, Lord, you were unjust to me or you were unkind to me or you did not show mercy. No one will be able to say that. No one. If today you hear, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Don't go back to that bed of fornication. Don't go back to that exercise of inordinate affections. Men laying with men. Women laying with women. Throwing around idle words. There's no tact. There's no wisdom. 